All right, thank you, Lauren. Um, so good morning, everybody. My name is Sarah Palmer, and I am our Violence Prevention and Volunteer Coordinator with Victim Services of Dodge and Olmstead Counties. Um, so we at Victim Services are, are housed within um, the Community Corrections Department of our county government. Um, Victim Services, well, Community Corrections serves both Dodge and Olmstead Counties. Um, and so the primary part of my job is our prevention work. So I spend a lot of time in the schools in Dodge and Olmstead Counties, um, but also other places in the community. Um, talking about the types of violence that we see at victim services, particularly focusing on issues of sexual violence, um, things like sexual assault, sexual abuse, um, sex trafficking and exploitation, which we'll cover a bit today. Um, but thank you all for being here. Thank you all for wanting to learn more about these important topics. Um, and it is Child Abuse Prevention Month, but it's also Sexual Assault Awareness Month. Um, so lots of important, important things to talk about um, throughout this month of April. So I'm gonna go ahead and share my screen here. And let me get my slides popped up for presenting. Okay, can you all see um, the slides that I'm sharing? Okay, perfect. Um, so we'll, we'll kind of get into some terms here just to, to start us off with. But you've probably heard, you know, the terms human trafficking, sex trafficking, things like that thrown around before. Um, and there's a lot of ideas out there in the media, in, you know, different places that we hear of these topics. There's some misconceptions out there around what this stuff really looks like. Um, of course, at Victim Services, we deal with the day-to-day -day, uh, realities of what these types of harm look like, particularly within our Safe Harbor team. So at Victim Services, we have a team of three staff. Um, one regional navigator and two case managers who work um, for Safe Harbor, which is a statewide network in Minnesota through the Minnesota Department of Health. And um, they serve anyone under 24 or under who has been trafficked or exploited or who has at very high risk of those things happening to them. Um, and so just know that we do have the, the local resources for all of Southeast Minnesota, actually. Safe Harbor serves 11 counties in Southeast Minnesota, so kind of the whole um, corner of the state. Um, but just know that we at Victim Services are the local resource for anything pertaining to the, the topics that we're going to be covering today. So when we talk about labor um, versus sex trafficking, they both fall under the larger umbrella of human trafficking. Um, so human trafficking is when any one profits off of another person's exploitation, basically. Um, when we have labor trafficking, we have the recruitment, harboring, transportation, provision, or obtaining of a person for labor or services through the use of force, fraud, or, or coercion for the purpose of subjection to involuntary servitude, manage debt, bondage, or slavery. So labor trafficking is basically exploiting someone for labor, right? We see this um, sometimes on farms or, um, you know, in restaurants, we've even seen it, or um, if someone is working as a nanny or an au pair for a family. Those are some cases where we sometimes see this happening, depending on what's the dynamics of that work and if that person is being compensated fairly. Um, and then sex trafficking, on the other hand, is, um, of course, recruiting and harboring all of those things, but for the, the purposes of a sex act, a commercial sex act. Um, and force, fraud, or coercion only needs to be proven if the person is over 18 years of age. That's a U.S. statute. So... Um, if a person under the age of 18 is being sexually exploited for commercial sex, um, even if they don't recognize that they are a victim, even if, um, you know, they think they're choosing to do this, if they're under 18, uh, force, fraud, or, or coercion does not need to be proven. Um, they are a victim no matter what under the law because we know how these dynamics work and we know how exploitation works. Um, but again, labor trafficking versus sex trafficking, those are two sort of subcategories of the larger issue of human trafficking. So again, force, fraud, or, co or coercion are terms we need to understand when talking about, um, you know, when, when do we have labor trafficking, when do we have sex trafficking? So force would be things like physical restraint, beatings, rape, confinement, um, you know, physical force against the victim. Um, fraud could be anything like false promises, um, posing as a false agency, lying about working conditions or wage, or even posing as a romantic partner. Um, it's not uncommon in these cases to see that the trafficker is a romantic partner of the victim. 
Um, of course, they're being led to believe the situation is something different than it actually is when we have fraud. And coercion would be manipulating that person, um, threatening them. If a person doesn't have um, citizenship documents, it might involve taking, um, or if they do, it might involve taking their passport or other documents to uh, limit them that way. Um, making a person afraid of seeking help or saying no, and also sextortion, which we'll talk a little bit about today as well. But sextortion is um, extorting a person using sexual images or video against them. So if a person somehow obtains that image from a victim, they will use that against them to extort them. So they might say things like, if you don't send me more pictures, I'm going to take this one that I have of you and send it to everyone you know, or your whole family or your whole grade level or whatever it might be, um, extorting them using that kind of blackmail against them. So again, when we're looking at issues um, of sex trafficking, force, fraud, and coercion do not have to be proven if the victim uh, is under 18, because we know that if they're under 18, they are a victim no matter what. They are being exploited. Um, they are a vulnerable young person, and we want to get them services. So again, even if you know someone under 18 feels um, that they're choosing to be exploited, that this is a choice that they're making. Um, under the law, they will not be criminalized. They will get connected with resources and support. Um, a couple more terms that are important to go over. We'll talk a lot about consent today. Um, so again, that's basically giving permission for something or agreeing to do something, um, communicating yes. Um, it's really, really important when we look at issues of sexual violence, because of course, you know, a sexual relationship between two people of an appropriate age who are making the best choices for them and, you know, adhering to their own morals and values and being safe, that can be a healthy thing, but it becomes sexual violence when there is not consent in that interaction. Um, and consent has some different dynamics and things to consider, but sort of in its most simplest form, it's saying yes or agreeing to do something. Um, grooming is definitely a, a big factor when we're talking about trafficking and exploitation, particularly of young people. It's preparing or training someone for a specific purpose or activity. So sex traffickers and exploiters, um, unfortunately, are very good at what they do. They're very good at uh, getting close to a vulnerable young person, seeing those vulnerabilities and uh, grooming that youth. Maybe they see that that youth is lonely or doesn't have a lot of support in their life. Um, they're going to offer to be that support, right? Or if they don't have money to pay for what they need, they might offer to get that for them. All of these different ways that they're trying to get this young person to trust them, to get close to them, um, that is drawing them in close to ultimately be exploited. That's what grooming is. And then child labor exploitation um, would be a, violate, a violation repeated or willful of child labor standards that jeopardizes their health, well-being, or educational opportunities, or that causes serious injury or death of a minor. Um, and so we'll, we'll focus more on um, sex trafficking and exploitation today, um, but child labor exploitation is a whole, uh, a whole other kind of, of human trafficking and, and another form of harm. Okay, um, I'm going to play a short video here for you guys. Uh, you may have seen it before, but I use this video a lot um, in my prevention work, especially in the schools and with, with um, students. It boils down what is consent, what does consent look like? I'm just going to make sure that I'm sharing my sound because I know I need to do that. Okay. Oh, I don't know. I might have to pull it up online real quick. One second. Okay. Share again quick. Change sound. Okay, here we go. And they go, oh my God, I Oops, would sorry. love a. Back to the game. If you're still struggling with consent, just imagine instead of initiating sex, you're making them a cup of tea. You say, hey, would you like a cup of tea? And they go, oh my God, I would love a cup of tea. Thank you. Then you know they want a cup of tea. If you say, hey, would you like a cup of tea? And they're like, uh, you know, I'm not really sure. Uh, then you could make them a cup of tea or not, but be aware they might not drink it. And if they don't drink it, then, and this is the important part, don't make them drink it. 
Just because you made it doesn't mean you are entitled to watch them drink it. And if they say no thank you, then don't make them tea. At all. Just don't make them tea. Don't make them drink tea. Don't get annoyed at them for not wanting tea. They just don't want tea, okay? They might say, yes, please. That's kind of you. And then when the tea arrives, they actually don't want the tea at all. Sure, that's kind of annoying as you've gone to all the effort of making the tea, but they remain under no obligation to drink the tea. They did want tea, now they don't. Some people change their mind in the time that it takes to boil the kettle, brew the tea, and add the milk. And it's okay for people to change their mind. And you are still not entitled to watch them drink it. And if they're unconscious, don't make them tea. Unconscious people don't want tea. And they can't answer the question, do you want tea? Because they're unconscious. Okay, maybe they were conscious when you asked them if they wanted tea. And they said yes. But in the time it took you to boil the kettle, brew the tea, and add the milk, they are now unconscious. You should just put the tea down. Make sure the unconscious person is safe. And this is the important part again. Don't make them drink the tea. They said yes then, sure, but unconscious people don't want tea. If someone said yes to tea, started drinking it, and then passed out before they'd finished it, don't keep on pouring it down their throat. Take the tea away. Make sure they're safe, because unconscious people don't want tea. Trust me on this. If someone said yes to tea around your house last Saturday, that doesn't mean they want you to make them tea all the time. They don't want you to come around to their place unexpectedly and make them tea and force them to drink it going, but you wanted tea last week. Or to wake up to find you pouring tea down their throat going, but you wanted tea last night. But if you can understand how completely ludicrous it is to force people to have tea when they don't want tea, and you're able to understand when people don't want tea, then how hard is it to understand it when it comes to sex? Whether it's tea or sex, consent is everything. And on that note, I'm going to go make myself a cup of tea. All right. So that's a really great resource. Um, you know, kids definitely get the metaphor, right? Um, and it's a good conversation starter. Um, I will caution you if you go look it up on YouTube, make sure you look up the clean version. There is a not clean version with some F-bombs dropped in there. So just make sure that you're looking for the clean one if you're having um, this conversation with with kids, but it's a really great, um, you know, kind of lighthearted way to talk with kids about consent, um, making sure that they understand not only how um, to know if someone is giving them consent, but also to know if their boundaries are being um, stepped on and if they are being um, victimized in any way. So I'll get back to my screen here, or my slides. All right, let me share one more time. Okay. Um, so when we're talking about issues of sexual violence, especially against youth, it's really important to understand what vulnerabilities are and how they're used to exploit kids. So a vulnerability is anything that makes it um, easier for someone to target that person. Um, you know, sometimes when I talk to kids, they're like, oh, that's like a weakness. And I say, well, it's not necessarily a weakness, right? We all have vulnerabilities. Um, it looks different from person to person and situation to situation. And some people are more vulnerable than others. Um, but it's anything that just increases someone's likelihood of being harmed or makes makes them susceptible to harm, basically. Uh, an exploiter or a trafficker might see that and use that against them. Okay, So some vulnerabilities are temporary. You know, if somebody is temporarily um, unhoused, for example, right, that they may be less vulnerable when they find stable housing. Um, some are about personal feelings or struggles, you know, if somebody is struggling with low self-esteem or loneliness or anything like that, kind of a, a an internal vulnerability, that can definitely be used to exploit a person. Um, and some are part of our communities and our environment. So, you know, a vulnerability, especially for young people, might be like if they're having a tough time at home or not getting along with their parents, that does make them vulnerable, unfortunately. Traffickers and exploiters will see that and use that against them to, to groom them and to exploit them. And also for young people, just being young is in itself a vulnerability, right? If you think back to your own adolescence, you were probably um, a much different person than you are now. And in adolescence, the brain isn't fully developed. Um, you know, youth are still dependent on caregivers and all of these things inherently make teens vulnerable. 
and young and younger than teens as well. So examples of vulnerabilities, um, and this is not an exhaustive list, right? There are other vulnerabilities that aren't on this list, um, but definitely these these factors will make it easier for a harm doer to target a young person. Um, so for example, just being an adolescent, right? Again, just being young makes you vulnerable. And I tell, you know, when I talk to kids about this stuff, I'm like, now, does that mean that teens are stupid and can't make good choices? Absolutely not, right? That's not what it means at all. But just being young can be used against you by someone who wants to cause harm. Um, a history of abuse or neglect can make a person vulnerable. Again, low self-esteem, loneliness, um, questioning sexuality, we see really high rates, unfortunately, of trafficking and exploitation among LGBTQ youth, because especially if they're not being accepted um, by loved ones or if they're struggling with their own sexuality or identity, that can make them vulnerable. Um, homelessness is definitely a vulnerability. Lots and lots of trafficking and exploitation happening to our homeless youth, um, because, for example, if somebody offers them a place to stay, that's going to sound pretty good if the alternative is sleeping outside, for example. Um, but that exploiter might say, hey, you can stay with me, but you have to sleep in my bed. That might be kind of what that might look like. Um, addiction can make a person vulnerable if they're dependent on a substance. Um, long periods of parental absence, of course, not having strong parental support. Um, if they've been a victim of bullying, if they've been expo exposed to gang activity, um, if they're the member of any kind of marginalized population. Um, these are all things that can make a youth vulnerable to harm. And un unfortunately, traffickers and exploiters see this and um, they, they do target the most vulnerable. So I have an example of kind of a case study here, which coincidentally, this person has my same name, but it's not about me, um, but kind of a little example of how this might look, how a youth might be exploited. So I'll read through the scenario and just kind of pay attention to what were this young person's vulnerabilities and how were they used to exploit them? Her best friend introduced them. Things got serious quickly. David asked Sarah to live with him after only a month. Sarah was nervous about it, but she figured it was better than her current situation. Her parents were strict and she never had any freedom. They gave her everything she wanted except for affection and praise. David gave her butterfly feelings every time she saw him. He told her she was beautiful and kind and said he would do anything for her. As soon as she moved in, David changed. He asked her to have sex with one of his friends. He acted like he felt bad about it, but said that he owed some money and it would really help him out. Sarah didn't understand how David could be okay with her having sex with another guy, but she loved him and wanted to help. Afterwards, David told her how much he loved her. A few weeks went by before, oh, sorry. I think I stopped sharing there for a second. I was clicking something. Okay. Um, can you guys still see my slide? Okay, good deal. A few weeks went by before he asked for another favor. This time he wanted her, her to have sex with a few strangers to help pay rent. When she said she didn't want to, he started yelling that she was stupid and that she was lucky he was willing to take care of her. Sarah felt really bad because he had done so much for her, so she agreed. After that, David told her that this was how he expected her to pay her portion of the rent and other expenses from now on. All right, so kind of understanding this situation, what vulnerabilities did she have, right? She was having a tough time at home. Um, she didn't get along with her parents or thought they were too strict and was unhappy living there, looking for somewhere else to be. That made her vulnerable. He saw that. He offered to have her live with him. Um, she was young, right? And she found this relationship and was getting the attention and the affection that she wasn't getting elsewhere. He exploited that vulnerability. Um, so think about as a caregiver, right? Would you recognize this vulnerability if you were working with um, a youth or if you had a youth in your care who was vulnerable in this way? You know, things to look out for, right? Understanding if that youth is feeling vulnerable because of their home life um, or just because they're young, right? Or wanting that connection that they're not getting elsewhere um, and thinking about what could you have done to help this youth? What could you have done to intervene um, or step in to address the situation, right? Maybe family counseling, maybe um, counseling for her individually, but thinking about ways we can reduce those vulnerabilities are really key. Um, when you see a vulnerability, what are the ways we can reduce that vulnerability and reduce that risk that that youth um, might have? All right, here's another story um, to kind of go through and see how this youth is vulnerable. And it's important to look at multiple case studies, I think, because 
every situation is different and every person's vulner vulnerabilities are different. So I think hearing some of these examples of what this stuff really looks like. All right. Vincent was 16 years old when his mom lost her job and started having a hard time taking care of Vincent and his sisters. Vincent wanted to help, so he dropped out of school and started doing odd jobs around town. His family had to move into a small apartment and there wasn't really room for him, so he started sleeping on friends' couches. Sometimes he had to sleep on the street. He did find a drop-in center for homeless youth and the people there were very nice. One day, Vincent told a volunteer at the center that he was excited because he had gotten a job and was moving to a different state. After asking some questions that Vincent didn't know how to answer, the volunteer told him that it sounded risky and that he should try to learn more before making a decision. But Vincent felt desperate and decided to take the risk. Now Vincent works for a magazine sales crew, but he makes very little money and often doesn't have enough to eat. Sometimes his boss doesn't pay him at all because he says Vincent owes him for travel expenses. Vincent works very long days and feels that his situation is worse than before. The managers are often mean. They say they will not help him get home if he quits. Vincent is confused and too embarrassed to ask his mom or anyone at the center for help. So this is an example of labor trafficking, right? He was excited about this job opportunity, thought it was going to be the way out of his situation. Um, so was kind of led on by some false pretenses there, right? It was um, made out to be more than it really turned out to be. He was making very little. Um, his, he wasn't being paid fairly. His managers would withhold his pay. Um, these are all different dynamics that we might see in a labor trafficking case. So if we're looking at what vulnerabilities he presented with, um, had an unstable home life, right? His mom was having a hard time supporting the family. He was, wasn't even sleeping at home, right? Because he didn't have a lot of resources there. It was a small space and he had siblings. Uh, these all made him very vulnerable. He wanted a better life. He wanted to, you know, get on his feet more than he was currently. Um, he was dropping in to a center for homeless youth, right? Receiving social services. He, he was vulnerable in a lot of ways. And again, just being young makes him vulnerable. But these labor traffickers saw all of these vulnerabilities. They knew he was pretty desperate for a way out of his current situation. Um, and they used that desperation and all of the ways in which he was vulnerable to exploit him. Um, and he ultimately became that victim of labor trafficking. So thinking again, you know, as a caregiver, do you think you would recognize this vulnerability? I think this one may be a little more obvious than the other one, right? You know, he's uh, doesn't have a stable place to live, um, doesn't have enough resources to get his basic needs met. I think a lot of professionals um, in social services would see some pretty obvious vulnerabilities here. Um, but, you know, the, the volunteer at the drop-in center had said, you know, saw these vulnerabilities and saw that this sounded like um, a sketchy job opportunity and tried to intervene, right? But he was so excited for this little glimmer of hope that he had to get out of his situation um, and then chose to still go anyway. But thinking about, you know, again, what we can do to help youth is reducing vulnerabilities, uh, reducing risk. So seeing if we could maybe get him uh, set up with a more promising job opportunity close by um, could be one way to intervene so that he can make money, um, but hopefully in a, in a healthier, less exploitive way. Um, you know, that could be one way that we could help. Um, making sure that mom is connected with services that she might need and getting that support. So again, just stepping in and reducing those risks wherever we see them. All right, so a couple more kind of terms to go over here. And this is specifically looking at how youth might be exploited online um, or through technology. So one crime that is really on the rise is sextortion. So the word sex and the word extortion squished together. But this is a form of blackmail in which sexual images um, or information are used to extort non, uh, sexual or non-sexual benefits from the victim. So like I mentioned earlier, you know, an example of it might be um, somebody online or somebody the youth knows in person could go either way, but we see a lot of it happen through strangers online that youth connect with. Um, but they somehow convince this youth to send them a sexual image or video um, and then they use it against them. Okay, once they have it, it's in their control um, and they can do what they want with it. They might face consequences, but it doesn't stop them from doing what they want with it. So they might tell the youth things like, if you don't send me more of those photos, I'm going to take the one I have and send it to your parents or, you know, your teachers or your hockey team or whatever it might be. Um, or in some cases, they may demand that the victim come meet up and do sexual things with them. Um, or a non-sexual benefit would be like money, right? 
hey, if you don't send me $100 on Venmo right now, I'm going to take this picture and send it to everyone you know. Okay, that's what sextortion is. Um, and we actually had an, uh, the biggest sextortion case in U.S. history um, was a man right here in Minnesota a couple of years ago, kind of a crappy claim to fame that Minnesota has, but he had over 1,100 victims worldwide, uh, a man in St. Paul who um, he, you know, lived with family and had a job and appeared to be a normal person, but he was doing this online, uh, demanding more images from these girls that he was targeting online and threatening to send them to their families or their friends or their teams if they didn't send more. So that's what sex extortion looks like. We're unfortunately seeing um, a lot more of this happening. Also, it's happening a lot to male identified youth. Um, these things do not just happen to girls or young women. Um, this is happening a lot, a lot to guys. Um, revenge porn is another type of online form of harm we're seeing. And it's just like it sounds, right? Using a sexual image um, and it, uh, distributing it without consent. So this often occurs after a disagreement or a breakup, right? When tensions are high. So if one partner has uh, a sexual image of the other partner and, you know, um, things have kind of soured and they're wanting to get back at them, they might take that image and send it to other people to kind of humiliate them. That's revenge porn. Self-generated content um, is, of course, you know, anything that a youth creates of themselves, takes a nude photo of themselves um, in some states, and Minnesota is one of them. It is illegal to share or disclose any intimate videos or pictures if you are under the age of 18. That would, of course, legally fall under the definition of child pornography or what we're calling child sexual abuse material. Um, and so when I talk to students, most of them don't realize that if they are under 18 and they take a nude photo, they just committed a crime. They just created child pornography, even if it's of themselves, that's still illegal. Now, does that mean that the police are going around arresting every single teenager who's ever sent a nude? No. Um, but it, under the law, they can get in trouble for it. And the harsher penalties would be if they forward anyone else's photo or video, then they'd be disseminating child pornography, um, which a lot, um, a lot of times a youth, their picture is going to go further than they intended it to. I talk to teachers all the time who are like, yeah, we're dealing with this right now with a student whose photo, um, you know, they sent to this person they were flirting with or dating or whatever, but then they shared it with more people. And now a bunch of people have received it that that young person didn't want to. Um, that can be really, really harmful and damaging. But um, I really try to make sure that students know if they are under the age of 18 and they take a nude photo or video, they just created a crime, right? They just created child pornography. Um, but if their images are out there and they need help taking them down, um, we have resources here with Safe Harbor within our police department um, to get these things taken off the internet. Even if they were the one to initially um, send it to someone or post it or whatever that might be, we're not looking to criminalize kids. We want to get them connected with help and resources um, because you know if somebody else is sharing their images, and spreading them around, um, they are the victim of crime. All right, so I've got a couple more little examples here. Um, back to the terms, we're gonna determine whether they were sextortion, revenge porn, or self-generated content. Alejandro and his girlfriend Ashley broke up last week after being together for one year. Ashley was mad at him for flirting with her friend. To get back at Alejandro, she airdropped a nude picture of him to everyone in their school. Alejandro felt humiliated and betrayed. The picture was supposed to be private and he only sent it to Ashley because he loved her. Um, all right, anyone wanna unmute and tell us is that sex, uh, sextortion, revenge porn or self-generated content? Okay, um, pretty clear case here of revenge porn, right? You've got somebody getting back at someone and using a sexual image to humiliate them, right? All right. Sam broke up with his girlfriend, Laura, because he found out she has an X-rated private Snapchat. He is a senior in high school and Laura is first year college student. They're both 18. Laura posted a nude picture of herself on Twitter as a preview of the content on her profile. Sam in anger retweeted it with the comment, this is why we're not together anymore. Um, so if we're looking at what happened here, this would not be sextortion because no one is trying to uh, extort anyone for anything. Um, it's also not revenge porn. So she posted the photo herself. Um, she is 18, so she can legally do that. This would not be either. 
Okay, now it doesn't make it right to be retweeting with hurtful comments or anything like that, but you know, she um, is 18, so she's able to make that choice to post that and uh, nobody did anything illegal here. It wouldn't be sextortion or revenge porn. Couple more examples here. Kendrick and Carlos are sophomores in high school and have been in a relationship for two years. They love each other and occasionally send each other nudes. One day, a classmate, Rebecca, stole Carlos's phone and sent a nude picture of Kendrick to herself. Rebecca knew that Kendrick's parents were very strict and were not aware of his sexuality. Rebecca used this information to her advantage. She told Kendrick that if he did not help her cheat on their final exam, she would send his parents the nude pictures and out him. Okay, so this would be an example of sextortion. So this would be a, a non-sexual um, thing of value that she's demanding of him. She wants him to help her cheat on the exam. And she knows uh, about his sexuality and has, you know, photo evidence of the interactions between him and his partner. And she's going to share that with his parents if he doesn't help her cheat on this exam. Um, so she's using that against him as leverage. That would be an example of sextortion. One more here. While Adrian was in class, someone anonymously airdropped him a nude picture of a sophomore in high school. He wasn't sure who the person in the picture was, but it looked like a girl in his seventh period class. He decided to share it with his friend, Carlissa, because he thought it was funny. Okay. So this wouldn't be sextortion and also wouldn't be revenge porn because he's not getting back at anyone. Um, but he would be sharing child pornography if this person was a sophomore in high school. Um, so that would that would be very illegal. All right. Um, so let's see, Abby, we have until one, is that correct? Okay, just making sure I'm doing okay on time here. Um, we're going to talk a little bit about some of the language that we use when we talk about these issues and how that can impact the way um, that these issues are seen and handled. So one activity that we do um, in the Not a Number program, which this um, caregiver presentation is basically a of a, a, a caregiver version of our not a number program. Um, I'll quickly just mention what that would be or what that is. So it's a five module unit that um, myself and two of my colleagues are certified in, but it's specifically for youth like 13 to 18. And we do small groups um, or, you know, anywhere from like 10 to 20 ish youth at a time in the group. And so it's five different lessons. So we're there over the course of five different days typically. And we talk with youth about these issues, about exploitation and trafficking and um, how we can reduce their vulnerabilities and keep them safe from these issues. Um, I really like this program because it's not like an information dump. It's not like, here's what you need to know. Um, there's a lot of different activities that help you think about these things um, on a really real level. And one activity that we do, we give them uh, a sheet of paper with just a blank face on it, like what, what's on the screen here without the words. And we ask them to write down um, things, hurtful things that people have said about them. And they can quickly come up with a lot of things, unfortunately. Most youth have been called some horrible things, whether it's by parents, um, hopefully not parents, but sometimes, um, but definitely people at school, um, other people they know, uh, and those things can really stick with a person. So we have them write down all of these hurtful things that have been said to them or about them, and we then have them cross them off. Um, and kind of, it's sort of symbolic, like, no, I'm not this. And then we have them flip it over and write positive things about themselves. Unfortunately, they can often come up with the negatives much quicker um, than the positives. And so if they're having a hard time coming up with the positives, we have them um, pass the sheet around so that their peers can write the positives about them. And they, they can really quickly say positive things about their peers. Um, and that that can you can kind of see their face change when they see those positive things that are written. Um, but language does have an impact, right? The, the old saying, sticks and, sticks and stones may be, break my bones, but words may never hurt me. That's not true, right? Our, our language has impacts um, and it can resonate with that person. So I'll play a brief video here. Another one, oops, I don't know if I have this one all ready to go. I don't think it's gonna be, it might not work. I'll kind of summarize it for you. Um, we show the youth this video and it's different young people who, um, most of them are actors, but one is talking about their own personal experience, but they're all true stories. The actors are talking about um, real survivor stories, but they've got, you can see in the photo, it's like a, a label that's been attached to them, right? Uh, a negative term that's been sort of pinned to them. 
And in the video, they tear the labels off, right? And say, I'm not, I'm not a label. I'm not a number. I can't be defined by these words, right? So um, kind of cheesy, but it's got a good message about how our words do have meaning. Um, but at the end of the day, nobody is a label. Nobody is a number. Nobody is a statistic. Um, really reminding them of their humanity and their worth. All right. Um, so that kind of summarizes that activity that we do with the kids. It's a really good one. We also do an activity where we show the kids photos of convicted sex traffickers. And we've got like 10 different photos that we use. Um, they're all different traffickers. I kind of fib a little bit and tell them that 50% are traffickers and 50% aren't. Um, and we have them go to one side of the room if they think this person is a trafficker, go to the other side of the room if they think they're not. Um, and they have to kind of make judgments based on a person's appearance um, and kind of think about, you know, who is doing this harm, right? What does a trafficker look like? Um, but these are some of the photos of the traffickers um, that we show them. And again, these people have all been convicted, um, but some of them, you know, for the first one, for example, They'll be like, oh, she looks like a grandma. She's not a trafficker. And they'll go to the non-trafficker side of the room or like the guy with the military uniform, right? Oh, well, he's not a trafficker or the cheerleader um, or, you know, the guy in the suit, right? He looks professional. Um, they have to make these snap de decisions about whether or not this person is a trafficker. And again, you know, spoiler alert, they're all traffickers. And so at the end of that activity, I'm like, yeah, I kind of lied to you guys a little bit. They're all convicted sex traffickers. And they're like, oh my gosh, really? Um, and then I give them a little... Um, summary of each person's bio and their crimes. Um, and it really, you know, hits home that anybody could be doing this, right? These people don't look like the boogeyman. Um, the, the cheerleader actually was a local case. Um, she was the cheer captain at Hopkins High School in Minnesota. She trafficked one of her teammates um, on the cheer team, a girl with some developmental disabilities, and she saw that and exploited her vulnerability. Um, so, it really hits home with, with kids when they see like, this could be anybody, right? I wouldn't necessarily know just by looking at someone, if they wanted to harm me, I need to know how this stuff works and what to really keep an eye out for. Um, so talking about, you know, how we can prepare youth to face some of these risks, right? Because if we can't always recognize an exploiter, how will our youth be able to? You know, I think if any of us saw these people on the street, we wouldn't be like, that's a sex trafficker, right? Because it's, you don't recognize just by looking at someone. So it's really important to um, establish connections with youth. That is the biggest way we can prevent this stuff from happening. Um, you know, I've talked to caregivers in these trainings who are like, well, just take their phone away and just lock them in their room. And don't let them, you know, keep them grounded, that kind of thing. Uh, if they know this is going on with the youth, but that's really not the answer. The answer is establishing connection, building trust, um, and sorry, my dog is barking. Nova, quit, quit. Um, being able to communicate so that they know that they can turn to the adults in their lives. Quit. I'm sorry, guys. Um, and making sure that they're. I'm gonna throw her outside. I'm so sorry. One second. Sorry about that. Okay. Um, again, establishing connection is the biggest way that we can prevent um, this from happening. If a youth feels connected and feels supported, they're not going to be looking for that support in potentially harmful people. Um, so building trust, making sure there's that communication, that open communication, so that we know what's going on with the young people in our lives. Um, so it's also important to talk to young people about victim blaming. And you've probably heard statements like this before um, in cases of sexual assault, sex trafficking, any kind of sexual harm. Victim blaming is a really big cultural issue that we have to tackle if we're going to tackle these types of violence. So, you know, in cases that you're aware of personally or that you've seen in the media, you've probably heard at least some comments like this, right? Well, you didn't say no, right? Did you scream? Did you fight back? Did you, you know, punch the person, right? Well, you didn't say no, so it wasn't really sexual assault, which of course, that's not a, that's a really problematic statement. Or how much did you drink, right? Um, 
for male victims, we hear things like, well, he's lucky. Who wouldn't want that? Right. Of course, you know, this isn't sexual assault. Guys just always want sex. That's a common misunderstanding. Men can be victims of sexual violence too. Um, or you always sleep around. I bet you wanted it, right? Using someone's sexual history against them. Um, or you were asking for it, right? Like, look what they were wearing. Of course, you know, this is going to happen to them. It's a rite of passage. They were just having fun. Did you expect him to read your mind? Um, so all of these statements are putting the emphasis on a victim's behavior and not the behavior of the person who hurt them, right? It's totally backwards. We're blaming the person who got hurt and not the person who hurt them. Um, and if we're going to tackle these issues, we need to put the blame in the right place, right? The person who did something wrong is the person who chose to be violent, not the person who was the victim. The victim's behavior never causes sexual violence. Um, sexual violence is caused by cultural factor factors that perpetuate it. But at the end of the day, that one person's um, choices. Um, let's see here. Okay, I see a question. Um, could you let us know the title of the label video? Also, how often do you present in schools? Um, the label video, I don't believe it's on YouTube. I can try to get a hold of uh, like a digital download of it and send it out. Um, I can definitely do that. Um, I present at schools most of the school year, um, just about every day. I've been in and out um, of schools a lot. Um, my presentations start at fifth grade. I'm trying to get younger than that because younger kids do need education on you know, sexual abuse and things like that. But my fifth grade presentation um, is specifically on the issue of child sexual abuse. So I talked to fifth grade kiddos about um, you know, healthy, uh, trusted adults and who you can go to if anything happens and what is and isn't okay. And, you know, um, things like that. It's a very, you know, fifth grade level talk about sexual abuse. Um, and then middle school, seventh grade, I typically talk to, um, students about sex scene and other internet safety things. Uh, it's called living in a digital world is the title of the presentation I usually do for them. Um, eighth grade, I typically do exploitation through technology, which talks about how um, traffickers and exploiters use social media and the internet to recruit youth, um, a lot of the same themes that we're talking about today. And then for high school students, I have one um, called the spectrum of sexual violence, where we talk about sexual assault, consent, um, the different forms of sexual violence, um, everything from, you know, hurtful words all the way up to rape. Um, and that one can be a little heavier. So I keep that typically for, um, 10th grade on up, but I also have one called the mask you live in, which is based on the documentary of the same name and, um, talks about harmful masculinity and how, um, you know, some of the expectations placed on boys and men can encourage some of this violence and the problems there. Um, and then we've also got the not a number program, which I mentioned, which is five modules, We've also got safe dates, which is 10 modules. And um, that one is specifically on all forms of dating violence. Um, not there's one of the modules is about sexual violence, but the rest is basically just healthy relationships. Um, and then I do have a program as well, specifically for youth on the autism spectrum, um, healthy relationships kind of in that lens. So went off on a little tangent there, but yeah, I'm in schools almost every day. Um, and that's kind of the, the breakdown of my different presentations for the grade levels. So yeah, with victim blaming, um, youth will often tell me, you know, that this stuff happens because someone was drinking or because someone was using drugs or because they were at a party with people they didn't know or whatever that may be the case. And I, I remind them like, you know, people can make risky decisions that might make them more vulnerable, but that's not what caused the violence, right? It only made them vulnerable to the violence. The cause of the violence is always, always um, the responsibility of the person who caused the harm. So victim blaming um, is really important to unpack in these conversations. So some tools to put in your toolbox as people who work with youth, um, what can you watch out for, right? Things that might send up a red flag for you for any of these types of harms. Negative um, peer relationships, right? Um, you know, definitely making sure that you know who the youth in your life are hanging out with, making sure that those are positive relationships and um, positive people in their lives. Um, if, uh, if a youth has a new older romantic partner, right, that should send up a red flag, especially if they don't want to share information about who that partner is. 
um, we know that older people are capable of exploiting younger people. And that's something to keep an eye out for. They're being secretive about who they're talking to. Again, that's a concern. Um, responding to job offers or model interacting jobs. So a lot of um, these cases, especially for trafficking, they may see someone online who offers them a modeling job, right? And what teen isn't going to be like, oh my gosh, I'm attractive enough to be a model. Wow. Um, but that might be a trafficker or exploiter trying to get close to them um, by reeling them in that way. Definitely, you know, if they're not looking for a modeling or an acting job through an actual agency, that's a red flag if somebody's just giving them these offers. Um, if they suddenly have a lot of new stuff, okay? So if they suddenly have money or devices or gift cards or new clothes and you're like, where did you get these things? And they aren't able to explain where all of that came from. That could be a concern that there might be some trafficking or exploiting going on. Um, they may be getting those things from the person who is exploiting them. Um, if they're becoming more and more isolated from others, that's another problem. Uh, trafficking and exploitation, these are really lonely places to be when you're the victim of these types of harms. And so, um, you know, if you're seeing a youth withdraw um, or being kind of closed off, you know, there could be a number of reasons for that, but definitely something you're going to want to check in with that youth about. Um, again, risky online behavior. Um, I I tell kids all the time, I will sleep better at night when kids and teens stop talking to strangers online because of the stuff that I hear and see in this line of work. Um, there are people out there every day. This is, you know, tra again, traffickers are very good at what they do. They know how to recruit online and they know how to um, talk to teens and they have more access to teens and kids than ever before because most kids are online to some degree. Um, chronic running away, that's definitely a, a concern. What are they doing when they're away from home? Um, signs of physical abuse, not uncommon to see that a victim of trafficking or exploitation is harmed not only sexually, but also physically. Um, an informal job agreement or contract, right? If something's kind of like under the table and, you know, seems a little sketchy. Um, debt to employer or recruiter, okay, that's a big concern. Could be potential for trafficking there. Um, if they're doing hazardous work without the necessary protections, um, risky sexual behavior, um, controlling or abusive dating relationships and loss of interest in age appropriate activities. So again, you know, a lot of these things can be red flags for multiple types of harm going on, but just things that we want to be look, uh, looking out for and, you know, having a conversation like, Hey, I noticed such and such, you know, can you tell me about what's going on? Not in an accusatory way, but just coming from a place of concern. If you see any of these things. Um, yeah, some, some online phrases and terms here that traffickers uh, and exploiters throw out there to start that grooming process to try to find a youth online that they can get close to. Um, you don't seem 15, you're so mature for your age, right? Well, what, what teenager doesn't wanna be treated like they're more mature? This is something they're gonna wanna hear. Traffickers and exploiters know this. Um, I'm 26, something wrong, you don't trust me, right? Trying to, you know, be like, well, hey, you know, everything okay? Age is just a number. I can't wait to see you. Um, my parents were strict too. I know how you feel. That really sucks. They told you no, so unfair, right? Trying to validate a youth's frustrations. Um, I'm going to be in town soon. Let's get together. Just sneak out. I'll pick you up, right? These are common phrases that harmful people online will say when they're trying to get a youth on the hook and to draw them in. Um, some more signs to watch for, specifically when talking about online safety, if they need to take any calls in private. Um, that, you know, and youth want their privacy, right? This doesn't necessarily mean they're being trafficked or exploited, but kind of a heightened level of privacy, hiding their screen when you come in the room, um, becoming increasingly secretive, spending increasing time online, um, right? That's, you know, unhealthy in any situation if a youth is constantly online, but definitely something to be concerned about. Not talking openly about online activities, uh, really important for parents and caregivers to know what their youth are doing online, to know who their online friends are, the same as they know about their in-person life. Um, vague talk of new friend with no details, right? Like who really is this person? Um, and then again, patterns of leaving home for long periods of time. So we're almost out of time here, but just kind of some um, thoughts I wanna send you guys with. When we're talking to our youth about these issues, um, and again, the biggest way we can prevent these things is to have connection, connection and trust and communication with the young people in our life. That's the biggest tool we have against these type of harms. Um, really important to be non-judgmental, right? 
nothing's going to shut a youth down quicker than if you are trying to talk down to them or trying to tell them they're doing something wrong. Um, watch body language, right? Watch how a youth is responding to what you're saying. Label behavior, not the youth, right? Don't be like, uh, you know, oh, you're, you know, you're doing all these things and blah, blah, blah. Talk about, I'm concerned about the, the ABC behavior, right? Put the emphasis on the action and not the youth who's taking the action. Um, discuss healthy and unhealthy relationships. Um, it's super, super important. Never assume that a youth knows what a healthy or unhealthy relationship is. Uh, if they, if they haven't been taught, you know, what is and isn't okay in a relationship, or if they haven't modeled or haven't seen, um, a healthy relationship in their life, they may not know, um, what, what is and isn't okay and discuss consent. Right. And it doesn't have to be a super uncomfortable conversation. That T video is a great way to open up these conversations with youth. Um, one of my teammates at Victim Services has a teen daughter and show her, she had some friends over for a sleepover and they watched the tea and consent video and the rest of the night they're walking around practicing consent. Like, oh man, do I have consent to use your phone charger? Things like that, right? It doesn't have to be super uncomfortable and heavy, um, but really important things to be talking with youth about. Um, don't dispute facts, right? Don't get into arguments about these things. Don't question their motives. Don't react with disgust or shock, even though it may be difficult if you do hear what's going on in their life. Just really try to be non-judgmental. Don't expect a full disclosure, right? Uh, it takes trust and communication to kind of get to the bottom of some of these things. And don't expect youth to recognize victim status. If um, a youth is being trafficked or exploited, they may not realize that they are a victim of this type of harm. They may not see the situation for what it is. They might just think they're in this new relationship, right? And this is just how their relationship is. Um, so Try not to label them as a victim. Try not to expect them to know they are a victim if any of this is going on. Um, I think that is all we have time for today. Um, this is normally a two and a half hour training, so I've really kind of condensed it for today. Um, but I think we hit a lot of the important parts. So um, I will gladly open it up for questions if anybody um, has anything in these last couple of minutes. And feel free to unmute or throw it in the chat, however you'd like to chime in. And I'll let you guys know too, um, we do have a 24 hour crisis line at Victim Services here. I'll throw it um, in the chat. Um, let's see here if I can. There we go. I had a question. I was wondering if we had a youth in mind who we think would be a good uh, candidate for doing the like five session classes. How could we get mm -hmm. them signed up? Yeah, absolutely. So we last summer we did our first like referral based um, group and that went really, really well. We had a lot of referrals from um, youth behavioral health and um, juvenile probation kids they thought would be good candidates to receive this information. Um, so we did a referral based group last August um, during the school year. And, you know, it works best for us to kind of come into spaces where youth already are, whether it be uh, a class or, you know, a, a group or something, you know, where youth are already together. Um, that definitely we found works the best if you have, you know, if you identify a group of kids that you'd like to have it for just because, the, the it structurally and logistically it just works a little better. Um, I don't know if that answered that question, but you can definitely let us know. And once we get that group um, uh, scheduled for summer, we'll start sending out um, the information into the county um, about how to refer youth for that. Um, but if you have a group already kind of together that you'd like us to come in for, please let me know because we'd love to be there. Yeah, any other resources? Um, Let's see. Yeah, definitely. Uh, it's hard when kids are wanting to be online um, and we've got to keep them safe. Right. And there's uh, there's it, it's so tricky. So I think one um, one good resource is um, NICMIC, National Center for Missing and Exploited Children. Um, oh, I'm so sorry. I was thinking that was in the in the group chat. Um, yeah, more resources just for everyone though. National Center for Missing and Exploited Children is a great one. Um, 
Also, let's see, loveisrespect.org has a lot of great resources. They have um, sort of like conversation starters that can help you have these conversations with youth. So I'll put them in the chat here. Nick Mech, um, love is respect. Um, a lot of really good online resources. Oops, I'm sorry. I, I'm clearly not very group or uh, very Zoom literate here. <laughs> um, here we go. Nick Mech, love is respect. Um, definitely check out their websites. They've got a lot of really great information available to the public. Um, and NICMIC has specifically a lot of online safety stuff um, with their NetSmarts program. Love is Respect has a lot of um, resources for healthy relationships. Um, definitely good places to go to go for more info. Any other questions from the group here? All right. Well, feel free to reach out to me directly anytime. You know, if you'd like to get um, more information or if you would like to have a not a number group or would like me to come in for any um, education for youth, I'm, I'm your local resource. So please never hesitate to reach out. Thanks, everybody, for attending. Thank you. Thank Sarah. you so much, Sarah. Thank you. I have a question. So I didn't hear well, but to get a certificate, um, where do we go? Are you able to see the um link in the chat that says CEU survey link? Uh, oh, see, I see it now. Yes. So fill out a survey, and then at the end there will be um like a downloadable credit so that you can get credit for attending. Okay, sounds good. Thank you. Yeah, thanks. I'm happy to chat further with anyone who has any more questions. Yeah, thanks so much, Sarah. This is awesome. Yeah, absolutely. Thanks for having me. I will speak to any group who's willing to listen to me. So <laughs> if there's yeah. ever any other kind of event you'd like to bring us in for, definitely reach out. Will do. I'm kind of, yeah, I'm like racking my mind to think about other groups that I think it could work out for. And I, I think there might be a couple of awesome opportunities over the summer, possibly like um, with Sunbro Valley or something mm -hmm. too. So I'm, I'll speak to my supervisors about it. Maybe we can get something organized. Okay. Yeah, definitely. I'm I'm trying to um get more stuff going on in the summer. Mm -hmm. Um, you know, I have more capacity to do some of these like small groups and things like that since I'm not in the schools in the summer. Um, so yeah. if there's ever you know an opportunity that you see to hold a small group or anything like that, um, definitely something we want to do more of. Yeah, I think that that could work out too because kids have more time in the summers, and it's kind of hard actually, teens especially to fill their time in the summer mm -hmm. if they're not working there's just yeah. not really if if they don't have a job it's hard to kind of fill up the time <laughs> yeah um so this would be awesome yeah um all right well if, if nobody else has any questions i'll go ahead and stop recording and end okay th sounds thanks good again. yeah thank you abby have bye a bye. great rest of your day bye bye you too